advertising solutions for Cadent. We are a television advertising company where I focus on advanced TV and get to work with a lot of great CPG partners like Danone. Super excited to get to talk to Eric and Linda today about an amazing topic, creativity. Um, I'm going to start with Linda. Um, I feel like we should first tell people what Danone is. I think everyone's like, what is it? So if you don't know, Danone owns like Evian Water, Stoke Cold Brew, International Delight, all your silk you know, plant-based, so those are just a few of them, just to give you guys a heads up. Top 15 food and beverage company. That's all you need to know. Well, I apologize, because I thought everybody already knew. D Danone, we know. Evian, water, I think she has it up here, yeah, yeah. So when we came up with the topic of creativity, um, one of the things that I think of is innovation, pushing things forward. I know, Linda, when you joined the company three years ago, a big push was to modernize the marketing efforts. Can you tell us how creativity played a role in that? Yeah, absolutely. So when I joined Danone three years ago, I will say that our marketing was stuck in the 90s. It was very product focused, very traditional. Um, we have one of the largest yogurt portfolios, and you probably all remember our Jamie Lee Curtis ads, our yogurt helps you poop. Um, lots of bite and a smile, very traditional, very expected marketing and advertising. And so that was literally the only objective my boss gave me was get us modern marketing marketing and insert our brands into culture. And so creativity has been a huge part of how we've done that. We've built out an internal agency and brought on our new executive creative director to really oversee all of our creative efforts and really focused on how do we think creatively, not just with our campaigns, but across everything we do. We've modernized our marketing mix, how we talk to consumers, um, the types of stories we're telling with our brands, the types of companies we partner with. Everything we do now is through a very different lens, and it's not just about selling product, which is obviously still important, and I still get measured against that, but it's also about are we telling the right stories, are we connecting with consumers the right way, and are we inserting our brands into culture? Yeah, that's, a, that's a great answer, and I think proof of performance is something we'll be talking about, but before we do that, I know that in-housing is a big move. A lot of major brands are doing it, Unilever, Craft, Frito Lay. Eric, I, I know you have, though, your name tag says Linda. Yeah, yeah, I, I am Eric, so if you see me, that is Linda. <laughs> We're both Lindas. But you can ask that Linda all the hard questions. Yeah. <laughs> that was confusing. Um, but I know you've had a tremendous amount of experience in your career working with in house teams. First, I'd love to hear about Danone's approach, and then sort of the big question when you're doing in house, how do you work with traditional agency partners or other vendors? partners that are looking to get in the mix. Okay. Can I can I answer all those questions together? Is that, that would be amazing. Okay, okay. I, I think the, the the notion that an in-house team uh, you're building that, that you don't need traditional agencies or any sort of external, it's just, that's never gonna happen. Like, I don't think it's ever gonna be an all or nothing thing. Uh, I think it's all about matching probably the, the, the business objective and the ambition of the company to the right partners, right? And, and from there it goes into resources, bandwidth, stakeholders you have, but you, you start there, what is the objective, what's the ambition? So at Danone, we have a hybrid model. So we staff internally uh, our strategic part, like our, our strategists, producers, project management. Uh, we outsource all creative. So we hire freelance teams, partners, sometimes very small boutique agencies, and that's working really well. It, especially right now, there's a huge economy right now of freelance creatives who are world-renowned, working freelance, doing great, so we have that model. Uh, but I've been to other places where we've done it differently, right? So in, in publishing, uh, I was the ECD at a publisher, and our margin was all through video content. So brands would come to us as part of a media buy, you know, hey, we'll give you this amount of money, can we get three, you know, videos. Those margins were all there, so we staffed producers, directors, editors, which would be insane for most CPG brands to do, right? So that's that model. And then we freelance writers, because that's how it worked. 
Then I worked for another large CPG where we built everything in house. So full time employees, 120 people deep, built just like an ad agency, strategists, copywriters, art directors, and that worked really well for that company for what they needed, right? And so for us, this is working really well, not only because of uh, how we need to flex as priorities change, as allocations of budget change, we're able to adapt a lot quicker or adapt with culture with what's happening. How do we need, do we need to bring in the right people? Do we need to bring in, do we even need an agency? Do we need to bring in an influencer? I'll go to TikTok and find an influencer, like you are my creative director. You're gonna make my stuff or go straight to a production partner. So I think it's all about right, matching the right solution um, you know, to the right objective and problem. That's a great answer about matching and, and putting them together. Can you talk a little bit about how budget comes into play there? or timing, yep. or if you're a bigger brand versus a smaller brand? Uh, timing is, is, you know, if you don't have time to onboard uh, an external partner properly, it's gonna be really tough to hold them accountable to make great work, right? So it, like, timing is actually sometimes more important than budget. You know, you can't just throw the money at the problem, so timing is big. With budget, yeah, I mean, I think that has a big thing to do with it. If we have the money to bring in external partners, we could bring them in a few different ways. We could bring them into partner with our in-house team, or by the themselves, so that is a huge contributing factor to what we do. We love taking some of the smaller brands with lower budgets in-house, staffing that, and getting huge ROI on that. So again, if there's a innovation coming out for the company, huge eyeballs, important for the company, we're willing to invest in external partners, especially if we have the, the time ahead of time to make sure they're good partners and they, they feel like a good environment of understanding of our business. Yeah, it's all about fit for purpose. We have a portfolio of over 20 brands, and we don't treat them the same, right? So to Eric's point, we prioritize what are the big bets that are going to have more focus and visibility, and then they're going to get a disproportionate amount of funding, probably partner with the bigger external partners versus the smaller brands. That being said, we challenge our small brands to deliver creative as good, if not better, than the bigger brands and bigger budgets. Can you talk about the collaboration when you're working together about making these choices? Obviously, you're working on tons of things, lots of details. Um, if Eric wants to go to an influencer, is that just something that happens? How do you guys collaborate in that process? I think it all comes down to trust and empowerment. To your point, we have a huge portfolio of brands, all of which have multiple projects at any given time. And we all have the same goal, to drive creative excellence that drives our business objectives. And so if we're all focused on that, you can free people up to make the right decisions that are going to drive that for the brand. Yeah. You know, Danone has this thing. I'm going to bring up the tree. I'm sorry. I'm bringing up the tree. I know. This is Eric's favorite... Uh, like organizational so, model ever. He talks about it 20 years. Because I've never seen it before because everyone talks about who approves what, who sees what. It's always a long conversation. We have this tree and if it's a branch decision, that means I make the decision. I don't need to report back. You know, if it's a trunk decision, I need to make the decision and report back. So this is my boss, by the way. So she knows about it. And if it's a trunk decision, that means we need to have a lot of conversations with a lot of stakeholders. And so I break that down for my team. Uh, and a lot of times I do it by budget, uh, by big bet. So I don't know. I thought that's been really impactful for us to make and move quickly and, and not feel like I'm going to be in trouble for making decisions or my team. They know what, they ha what they're empowered to do. I was just going to build on that because we've also been really intentional about creating an environment where people can take risks. I think that's absolutely critical when it comes to creativity and unleashing creativity. If somebody's afraid to take risks or afraid to make a decision, they may develop good creative, but it's never going to be great. And our objective is to be great and to insert our brands into culture. And so we really have to work at creating an environment where people can swing for the fences and they may miss and that's okay. They're not going to get fired. They're not going to get yelled at. We're just going to try again. Um, and we've had failures over the years. Not everything has been great creative, but we're getting to more and more great creative these days because of that, I believe. We're empowering people and we're letting them take risks. If you, if you bat 300, if the whole team bats 300, you'll win the World Series. So you, you're just... probably in the Hall of Fame. Uh, it's pretty good. So Linda, as a leader, how do you get people comfortable and confident enough to make mistakes and not feel that way? I think it'd be a harder question to ask Eric since <laughs> you're his boss, but starting with I thought with we were that. giving him all the hard questions. I, I flipped it up because <laughs> you have all the best answers now. Um, um, 
I mean, I think for me, I try to lead with vulnerability and I share the times I've made mistakes. We all make mistakes. Um, and I have my wall of fame and then I have my wall of shame. And I share those campaigns, innovations, projects I've worked on that sucked. Um, and I think it's just as powerful to share those with people as the ones where you won the FE Award. And so um, we have very real dialogue, it's known, about everything. That's critical. Um, actually tracking what's happening and why. Um, Eric, as we're talking about great creative development and thinking about how to do it, I'm thinking about trust and communication and the feedback loop. We talked about this. Um, how do you get people comfortable to give feedback in a way that they don't feel judged because it's so important to the process? So can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, with people giving feedback, I mean, I really encourage our brand partners, people who maybe aren't creatives themselves. We have creative feedback training sessions, which people really love in our organization. Uh, just hosted one a, a bit ago, and it's all about giving feedback tied to a brief, right? I'm a big believer that you shouldn't be reviewing creative weighing in on creative unless you have reviewed and weighed in on the brief, right? And then when you're giving feedback, you are tying that directly to the brief. And sure, if you have a subjective opinion, you better veil it in a connection to the brief, right? Or we'll kind of dismiss it. And so that's one thing to help keep people keep on track. But also, like, it's an emotional sport, right? People have thoughts, and you want to hear that. You want to encourage dialogue, and you don't need a bazooka or tell anyone they're wrong on the meeting. That's what there's a lot of, we have a thing called one team feedback and so with our partners we'll be in the room we'll ask a lot of questions we'll share some observations but we always go off and make sure we have one team feedback going back but you just have to create that environment of ask questions turn your feedback into questions and now a lot of times it helps people feel a little bit more comfortable and, and you may not realize you may have an opinion on something and the creative director whoever may help explain and, and walk you there so I, I think questions and tying the strategy and Linda, you, you referenced several times in the prep a crystal clear brief and how important it is. And, and Eric, you mentioned how you have to come back to it if you lose focus or if there are other ideas that could be good that, that may not f fulfill what you're trying to do. How do you write a crystal clear brief? Um, obviously a lot of practice, but how, how do you come up with them in a way that allows Eric to refer back to it? Yeah, I think the brief is the most important part of the creative process. And I think what leads to a great brief are two things. One, really deep consumer insights. To Eric's point, creativity is an emotional sport. Everybody has an opinion. The number of times I've been in a creative review and one of the senior leaders is like, oh, well, my wife really didn't like it. <laughs> I don't give an F what your wife thought. Does the consumer like it? I'm sure she's a nice lady. <laughs> So having those deep consumer insights to really guide the brief is critical. And then we talk a lot about the creative process and where in the process you want the tension points. And I want my team having all those difficult discussions up front. They should be beating up that brief every which way until Sunday, until it's single-minded, clear, and grounded in consumer insights, because that's going to make the creative evaluation process that much easier. I, I love the word beating up the brief, because it's like, it, back to your point about making people comfortable, you have to make people feel comfortable about being critical. It doesn't mean if you're being critical, you, you may not have the final say on that, You may, not, but I want all that, especially in the briefing stage. I want to hear those contrary points of view, those differences, it's all going to feed into it, but a lot of that's making people feel safe, right? I know there's like, a, some people probably worked at P&G here, I never have, but I always hear that there's a feedback model where when creative presents, you start at the, like the lowest person in the room and you like circle around, and I can only imagine, do they feel comfortable sharing what they think because, well, their boss agrees. And I think that's really important for leaders. Like, Linda makes me feel comfortable having a point of view. She we might, don't always agree. Yeah, and she might disagree with it, and, and it would, but she makes me feel comfortable. And sometimes I have an opinion, and I'm also fine to be wrong, like, after I say it. But you have to let people share and, and let those gut feelings out. You will never get anywhere. 
so we live in a world of constant feedback um, via social media platforms. Often I'm sure you're seeing your brands referenced or talked about in these ways. Um, I think when we talked, you said you can go onto TikTok and see how people are really using the products and what they're doing. So I think talk about that as it relates to creativity, that you're seeing feedback from the consumer in a totally different way now. Um, and how does that impact how you're thinking about it? I'll, I can start. I'll be totally honest. We don't do a great job of social listening at Danone. That's one of our objectives this year is to get better at that. We do a lot of testing of our creative, and that's one source of input on whether or not our creative's resonating with consumers. But I think we need to do more of that real-time listening because, to your point, that's where consumers are truly using your product, engaging with your brand, viewing your content, and providing the real talk on what they think. Yeah. I, I love scrolling through because we have an international delight. It's like a flavored creamer, and people get so mad when like an LTO goes away or the, the things they talk about in the product you never thought about. And so when we're in the briefing process, uh, Linda's very right. We need to really amp up our social listening and real-time response. But I love using it in the briefing process to be like, what are consumer insights? Go on TikTok. You'll find the consumer insights right away. What do they not like about your product? Uh, people use International Delight, the cap. They take it off and they open it. With it, like things like that, you only learn from that. And so to me, TikTok's been one of the best consumer insight like discovery platforms I've ever used. Do you ever use that feedback to think about how you're going to respond to the market? And if you see something on TikTok, you say, hey, we're going to go on TikTok to, to confront it directly. Can I, can I bring it up? Which one? The International Delight one. Oh, yeah. Okay. Nobody's listening. It's slightly inappropriate. Um, so uh, a, t a TikToker online made a video with International Delight that has 8.2 million views, uh, almost 2 million likes, probably the most engaged thing we've done on TikTok. And it's so we didn't do it. Yeah, we didn't do it. And he zoomed in to our hashtag, which is Creamer Nation. And he goes, absolutely not effing using this hashtag. And then everyone started joking around about it. So the day after, so if you guys get it, if, yeah, hopefully you get it. Um, and um, the, the next day we contracted this person and now we've reposted it and duetted it. And we're like, what do you mean? And we started zooming in on different parts of our bottle that were like maybe a little suggestive. Uh, and we're like reacting to it so uh, yeah, like it's like you see people react like people and I think back in the day I feel like five six years ago my boss has been like no way oh my god this is so terrible I'm like they have our product they love the product they're just making fun of it let's get on the job and so now it's like wow that's incredible now we haven't reported this up to our bosses so just don't let them know uh, but yeah like I think it's working that's really well taking risks yeah you, you take risk and, and you let the the consumers tell you and, and let them be a part of the joke and with that it's become really successful consumers love being a part of the joke or telling the joke. Um, has it worked for different brands um, within the portfolio? Are there brands that are willing to take more risks, less? How do you define which ones do what? I think it all comes down to being authentic to the brand. Every brand has its own purpose, its own positioning, its own tone of voice, and we try to stay very true to that in how we leverage different media platforms, how we engage with consumers, and so, yeah, it is different. It's not a one-size-fits-all. The, the, the brand tone of voice has been so big on unleashing creativity, right? We spend so much of our internal resources developing our purpose, our tone of voice. We call them brand trees. Like, how do we express ourselves that is consistent, that when we go work with partners, it helps them jump right into unleashing that creativity. And so I think that's been a huge help because so many times in past jobs or as a creative, I was at a I was at ad agencies for like 15 years, right? And I would get a brief and it's been, it took so long to be like, do you all even know who you are? are, you know, and, and they may have thoughts on that, but I think that's something we do really well that helps unleash it quicker. Yeah, I call it freedom in a framework. To Eric's point, we have an entire in-house team of strategists and copywriters, and we spend a ton of time getting those foundational documents right, because when we understand our brand and we can get our partners to understand our brand, it unleashes all sorts of possibilities that are going to be very authentic to the brand. And, and Eric, you mentioned brand trees and brand world. I 
I'd love for you to just explain to us what that is and how you use it. Yeah, um, our, our brand tree set up um, the like the human tension with our products, the, the brand truth and the category tension. You kind of put all those together to find out your purpose and kind of solving the, the, you know, Venn diagram of those issues. That is then the start that we, that we build a brand book. So people may kind of be familiar with style guides here. It's, it's kind of similar to a style guide where we kind of add on to it, but a lot of it is like who we are or who we aren't. Like if we were a celebrity, who would we be, right? What's, what are the things we say, don't say? How do we come to life? Um, so it's a really beautiful, more creative version of a style guide that's used to inspire uh, new partners that come on, come on and help them start running right away with an idea of who we are. So proof of performance in the media landscape in 2023 is sort of a big topic. Um, doing more with less, all of these sort of things. When you're thinking about proof of performance, how does it impact creative? How does it, how, and how do you think it impacts creativity? If people know there's a key performance indicator against the work they're doing going into it. So at Danone, we believe you should measure what you treasure. Um, and we definitely do a lot of measurement throughout the creative process. We partner with Ipsos to test creative ideas through the development stage. And then we partner with System One to test our in-market creative. So we have all of those points along the way. We also then do marketing mix analysis to understand if it's truly working and driving ROI. But I think it's the way we use those pieces of measurement that make us different. Those are points of data. They're not the be all and end all. And back to risk taking and unleashing great creative. Great creative doesn't always test well. And so you have to sometimes take that risk and trust your gut and see what happens. It may not always work, but you won't know unless you try. And when we were prepping, you mentioned you like having a known KPI going into the process because that helps drive the process. Um, can you talk about that? Uh, it might change like the entire way we go about what are we making. So it goes back to who do you use in-house, freelance, because if the KPIs are engagement or, or awareness, that changes it drastically, right? It makes me think about where I want to go, who I want to go work with. Uh, I love that because that's how you then evaluate the creative. You know, I think, is there a strong call to action? Is there a purpose behind it? Are you, is there a reason for people to get involved? I think that's a huge one. That's very hard to do. So that would change who I go to, my in-house team, external, or like influencers. It also changes how we partner with media. That's been, I think, one of the, the best things about bringing Eric to Danone is his partnership with our media team. Everything we do now is thinking through holistically our creative and our media strategy. So we're putting the right content in front of the right people at the right time. How do you change the historical methods? So you've been measuring one way for a long time and now you realize, hey, the world's changed. We want to measure and do different things. How do you get that process going? It's not easy. Um, luckily, I do have an amazing team that is willing to try new things. Um, Eric's partner in crime, our VP of media, really values uh, a test and learn mindset. And so we're testing all of the evolving technologies and ways of measurement to see what works best for our business. And we're learning as we go. In an earlier panel, it was described uh, a budgeting process of like 5, 15, 80, 5 being that testing environment. How do you move from the test bucket into the full bucket? KPIs. Every test has KPIs. If we achieve them, then that can become a, a future partner. It becomes an easy selling story too. Like look what we hit with this budget with these KPIs. Hey, whoever we, whatever stakeholder, think about the scale of this, you know, so it builds a lot of trust with the pilots. And I think that leads to the tough questions about resource allocation. <laughs> How do you make those determinations in the purview of what we're describing? <laughs> That's why I get paid the big bucks. Um, Again, it's partnership with the brands and what our priorities are, and we're trying to get better and really focus in on how do we place big bets and put a disproportionate share of resources behind them, and that's going to mean there are things we can't do, and there are brands in the portfolio we can't fund, and that's been a big step change for Danone um, because it's like choosing your favorite children. Um, all the parents out there, you know you have a favorite child, um, and so every year we're going to pick the one that's going to do the most for our business, that has the biggest growth opportunity. And that means there are going to be some others that may not. But I think it actually
actually challenges our teams to think creatively and come up with ideas because they want to be the favorite child next year and get more resources. So it creates a little bit of friendly internal competition. Do you see a rotation of those brands then with some of the ones that have been on the outside coming in? Yes and no. I mean, I think there are ones that we're always going to have focus on because they're aligned with our strategy, right? So plant-based is a huge growth driver for us. We have a fantastic brand in Silk, which is one of the plant-based pioneers. And so I think that will always continue to be focused for us. But there are other brands that are small and growing. So Eric mentioned earlier Stoke Cold Brew Coffee. It's small, but it was one of the fastest growing brands in 2022. And so it does not have a huge budget yet, but I believe it will one day because it's actually really good so that's why it's like, delicious it's, it's working yeah it is delicious um, we're gonna open it up for questions but I want to ask one more question for creative yeah. what is the most important thing it has to do I think it has to evoke an emotion I think it has to stop you and it has to be mem memorable. So I think the evoking emotion leads to memorability. We, we've been, uh, I won't share too much, but we've been, like right now we're in an edit and there's something that's very polarizing to everybody. And, but yet the fact that we've all been talking about it so much makes it memorable and that's why we're really pushing for it. So to me, the emotion something gives you makes it memorable, that's the most important thing to me. And I'll build on that, I don't disagree, but I'll add it also has to be breakthrough, right? We live in a world where your attention's pulled in a million different directions, and so it has to be something that makes you stop and catches your attention, and you remember it. And I think we have a silk thing to show where we tried to do just that um, and stop people in their tracks. Are we, we able to see that? Can we show the silk thing? I don't know if we have the silk. Eric and Linda said they'd potentially act it out if we didn't see it. Has anyone seen the mustache stuff we just did? Anyone? No? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Check it out. Look up Silk Stash. Are there any questions? Go for it. Hi there, so much better. Um, as a corporation, you made a big commitment to being a certified B Corp. I'm wondering at the brand level, how that either influences your messaging and your brand strategy and or maybe the suppliers that you use or the channels that you use to reach your customers? Excellent question. So yeah, we're one of the largest certified B Corps in the world, and we truly put our money where our mouth is. For those that don't know, being a certified B Corp means that you're using business as a force for good, that the economic results that you deliver are just as important as the impact that you're having on people and communities. And our mission is to deliver health through food to as many people as possible. And all of our brands ladder up to that mission in their own way. So for example, Silk, which is a plant-based brand, is really focused on renewable resources and you know, plant-based living being better for the planet versus our Too Good Yogurt brand, which is a lower sugar, delicious option, the yogurt category, which is all about improving health. So all of our brands have a unique purpose, but all laddering up to the broader purpose of Danone. Do we have one more? Any other questions? Yep. Uh, Calvin Nichols, W Promote, it's an agency. Um, question here is for uh, Linda Flynn uh, on the left. Uh, how do you balance the need for expediency when it comes to creative? You know, you have that like TikTok, that real time interaction versus those brief, those long term development deployment plans. Like, how do you balance the two of those against each other? Well, we, I think we balance it really through our, high, our, our hybrid model. Like in terms of actually getting the work done, right? So like in-house, the fact that we have our strategist, project management producers, when I have two things happening very differently, right? I'm able to go get the right team for the influencer thing and the right agency versus just going to my agency and going, hey, I need you to do both these things at the exact same time. So I don't know if that fully answers, but to me it's, it's that model because then I get to choose the right people for the right job. I think that's a really tough answer when it's like, oh, I have a blank agency of record 
right? And I have them working on three or four things, big long-term productions. Oh, I had this, this popped off, go, go react to it. So I think the model we're building allows us to put the resources where we need it and just pull the right people in for those things. Great, we have time for a few more questions. Anyone else? Hi guys, Jeff from Inmobi. Um, thanks for being here. Just wanted to ask how you go about um, kind of parsing out content versus vehicle. So if you have content that you know works in, in some platforms, but you're testing the media, or are you looking at media that you know works for you and you test various content? How do you marry those when you guys are looking at new? Connections planning, my favorite topic. That's where I make sure Eric and Mike, our VP of Media, are joined at the hip, and Eric can talk about how that sometimes comes to life. You're saying when well, we have like above the line like content, and then we have like social content, and how we're like testing them on the different platforms. Just if, if you have a piece of content you know works, and you're testing TikTok, that content on TikTok, or if you're testing a new media with a piece of content. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, I. I to me, I, I love to. Um, Social is my favorite place to test any content because you get like immediate reaction to it. But I, I don't. I don't think if I'm understanding the question right, that I don't think you can. Um, kind of flip-flop those all the time, right? Content's just not content to be put anywhere, right? Like if you don't make content for that platform and you try to test that content on a platform that's not meant to, it's, it's never gonna work. I don't know if that's, that's kind of where you're, you're going yet. All right, cool. Anyone else? Hey, I'm Savannah from Zephyr. Um, I know that Danone is a Garm brand. How does that impact from a creative standpoint when you guys are looking at content and how does that also impact channels, social, you know, you, your marketing mix as a whole? Yeah, we, we sit on the board of Garm um, and attend all of their meetings regularly. And it's a topic of conversation that we have regularly, and I would say more so lately, given what's happened with Twitter, yeah. given the conversation <laughs> around TikTok. Um, so those are conversations we're having regularly internally, um, led by our VP and media, but in partnership with our corporate comms team, our legal team. Brand safety is obviously absolutely critical to everything we do. Um, and even beyond that, uh, Eric just mentioned this new ad that we're testing that's quite polarizing. We're looking at our media mix and probably going to avoid any conservative uh, outlets or content because this ad probably will not work well in those. Um, so even beyond brand safety, thinking about things like that for sure. But you know, as of now, we're, we don't have any active campaigns on Twitter for obvious reasons, and we continue to monitor TikTok. All right, one or two more. Anyone going once? All right, great. Um, first, Eric, extremely jealous of your photo over there. The flow is amazing. I'm going for a more professional look this year. Um, amazing insights from the from the Danone brand. Um, first, love being able to take the risks. I think that's a that's a great point. Being able to get out there with great creativity, fail but fail fast, move on. Um, really great. Um, and I love. I'm going to use this with my, with our team. Creativity is an emotional sport. I think that's a really really good point to to make. So, thank you. Amazing job. Thank you all. Thank you.